Welcome everyone. It is our September cocktails and fishtails and wowie are we excited to have Jen here tonight. Um, I don't know if, uh, if, you, if anybody's on social media and hasn't come across Jen on the internet, uh, her photography is stunning and is absolutely worth a follow. So we'll talk more about that soon. But for those of you tuning in, uh, we would absolutely love to know where you're watching from. Um, Jen's tuning in from New York of all places, so <laughs> we love that. Uh, I'm of course here in Tacoma, so we want to know where you're watching from and what beverage you're enjoying for tonight's presentation. This is Cocktails and Fishtails after all. Uh, so while you're getting settled in, uh, we always like to ask our presenters to share a favorite cocktail or one they at least like a lot this season and uh, tell us a fish tale of their choosing. So Jen, it's all you, cocktail and fish tale. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so uh, one of my favorite cocktails is from a, it's from a restaurant in Seattle called Plenty of Clouds and it's called Smoke and Mirrors. So it's rye and hibiscus and lapsang, souchong and bitters. And it's delicious. I am pretty much anything, any rye or bourbon drinks are perfect for me. I wish I had the ingredients to make that here in New York, but I do not. So this evening I just have some straight whiskey, <laughs> which will do the trick. Yeah, yeah cheers. <laughs> um, and so, uh, but a fish tail is, a uh, mine is more of an octopus tail than a fish tail. Um, but I had such an amazing experience this summer. I was out at low tide on the Olympic Peninsula and I was there with some friends. We were camping and we were out exploring the tide pools and my one friend was looking at me with this crazy expression on her face and calling me over. So I went over and there in this beautiful tide pool was a giant Pacific octopus just hanging out and relaxing. It moved around a little bit and some other friends came over. We were just admiring this octopus for quite a while and having, and then it tucked itself into a whole, underneath a whole bunch of urchins. And we were thinking about how many more octopuses there probably were around. If that one was, you know, we couldn't really see it anymore, but we knew it was there because we just saw it tuck in and we started to get up and then I looked over and there was another giant Pacific octopus to my right. And that one started moving around the tide pool and went over the other giant Pacific octopus and they touched arms and it was very exciting. So that's my, <laughs> that's my like tale. An octopus that's high five fishtail. is a pretty good fish tail. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it was amazing. Yeah, and for the, the largest species of octopus in the world, um, That's right. Got it covered. Uh, it looks like we have some folks tuning in from Gig Harbor, uh, Federal Way. Um, so again, for those of you watching tonight, let us know in the comments where you're tuning in from, what you're sipping on. And of course, as Jen does her presentation tonight, uh, mm. If you have any questions, that's the place to type those questions in so that we can have Jen answer those live at the end of her presentation. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Jen, uh, who is a professional photographer extraordinaire in the social media world. Um, I, I think there's a lot of fan folks uh, who know and love your work. Um, and again, if you're not following Jen, uh, this will be the presentation to like convince you to go on that journey because <laughs> it's fantastic. Uh, she also is, um, um, let's see, the field, the program, the field lead, field, I have it in my notes. I <laughs> almost remembered field everything. Pro field program field lead. Program lead for the Seattle <laughs> Aquarium Beach Naturalist Program. Uh, love, uh, we've gotten to do some beach walks with her before. So um, check out that program as well. I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about it. Uh, but with that, we are so excited to turn it over to Jen to take us on a journey of art and science tonight and um, learn more about her photography. So Jen, it's all you. All righty.
I'm getting there. <laughs> Absolutely. We do have to give you an extra big cheers for, you know, tuning in from New York, not in your home base. So uh, mm. totally appreciate your adaptability here. <laughs> well, I'm thank glad you. I could be here. And uh, thank you, Stina, so much for having me. I really enjoy, I've gotten to enjoy getting to know both you and Rachel and um, Carly over the past several years. And uh, so I, my name is Jen Strongen. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm going to tell you a little about art and photography and marine life this evening. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my, give you an introduction to myself. I'm going to talk to you about some of the gear that I use and uh, photography and animal encounters where the land meets the sea. That's my favorite place to go. So um, this picture is, uh, these are a couple of pictures of me out in the field doing what I love best. My pathway to photography and marine science has been a very non-traditional one. I have a BA in English literature and I had a plan in college to become a professor. And when I was in grad school, I realized that it wasn't really for me. So I took a different path and I found that I loved creating community around things I was passionate about. So my husband and I started a coffee business here, or not here, but in Seattle, in our neighborhood. And it was, and uh, still is a beautiful community gathering spot. But after having a child in 2007, we decided to sell our business and um, I chose to stay home with my kiddo for a while. And um, during those years, I got to spend lots of time on local beaches with friends who knew more about marine life than I did. And being around children and seeing the world through that lens of wonder and curiosity took me down an entirely different path. And I wanted to learn about everything I saw on the beach. And so I started photographing things to help me ID what I was, what I was looking at. And um, I just, photography became more uh, than an aid to me. Eventually it just um, sort of morphed into more of a, a form of creative expression. And so um, I found out that the Seattle Aquarium had a volunteer program, the Beach Naturalist Program. And I was so excited to learn about um, that I could join that and become a volunteer without ha having any background in marine science. So I did. And I was, I was hired on after my first year of volunteering and I've now been on staff for seven years. And so it was during this time that I also became more serious about my photography and I began showing my work and selling my work, and I continue to do that today. So like running the cafe, um, my job with the aquarium and my photography allow me to connect people in my community with something about that I am really passionate about. So this is the gear I use out in the field. Um, I have a very, um, I have a point and shoot camera that I can stick under the water. It's an Olympus TG6 with a flash diffuser on the front of it, which I find is very um, important to give me enough light when I am sticking that camera underneath the surface of the water. I also use an Olympus uh, Micro Four Thirds camera with a 60 millimeter macro lens and a Sony full frame camera with a 90 millimeter macro lens. And sometimes I also just use my phone. Uh, some other things that other tools that I have that I use, I use some creative lenses like lens baby uh, lenses. They are a really um, a tool that I, I lean on a lot for creative photography. I have a small macro attachment for my phone, which is a moment um, macro lens. I often bring a flashlight with me even during the daytime because a lot of the um, when you're tide pooling, there are a lot of uh, underhangs under rocks that are very dark and it's hard to have enough light even during the daytime. So having a flashlight or uh, something like this little loom cube, which is a small waterproof light that can illuminate cracks and crevices are really, really helpful. 
So macro lenses to me are like a portal to another dimension. They are a tool that helps me slow down and take a closer look when I'm out in the field. And sometimes I go out with a specific purpose, looking for a particular animal. And other times I'm just out there just to see what I can observe. And I find that the more that you look and the more you learn, the more that the natural world opens up to you. So this evening, we're going to start in the intertidal zone. And um, I wanted to start with this animal that is one of my favorites. I see Stina nodding her head. She knows it. <laughs> she knows what this is. So this is a stocked jelly if you've never seen one before. And I'm kind of obsessed with these tiny animals. They're super, super small, like an inch or so um, in, in length. And I learned about these animals from leafing through one of my favorite books, Pacific Northwest Marine Life by Lamb and Hanby. And um, this is a jellyfish that has a stalk. It's a sticky stalk and it attaches itself to things like this rock or eelgrass or seaweeds rather than one of the, rather than looking like a regular jellyfish that is um, drifting along in the water. And they have these pom-poms of tentacles uh, on their arms that they use for capturing plankton in the water. They are really, really challenging to photograph, especially because they like to live in areas where there is some swell. So um, finding one in an isolated tide pool that isn't um, being subjected to currents at the time is a really great, uh, it's a, it's, it's an advantage for getting a good photograph of them. Um, I take many, many photographs of them when I'm out in the field and usually only come home with maybe one or two that are successful. They're, they're a really challenging subject, but one of my favorites. Um, this is a standard jellyfish, a very small one. And uh, this is just, I, I was looking through photographs and thinking like, you know, it's really one of the things I love to do is just to be in one place and be really still and just look into the water and see what is around me. Um, I, it is one of my favorite things about macro photography is that it makes you slow down and makes you pay attention to the smaller things. And um, so this one is a common jelly in our waters, even though I think a lot of people may not notice it because it's so small, um, but it's called a hanging stomach jelly, or I like to call it the hanging belly jelly. And that part that you see coming off the jelly is its stomach and, and the folds there are the gonads of the jellyfish. Um, they're very tiny, very delicate and very, very beautiful animals. So this is taken, so all my photographs are taken above the surface of the water. I'm not a diver. And um, this, it's one of the biggest challenges is to not have glare in your photographs from the water when you're taking an image and looking down um, into a tide pool. But I do a lot of moving around and creating uh, shade with my body or trying different angles in order to eliminate any glare that I might have. So, um, and you know, when you've seen an animal enough times in the wild, I feel like you're, you have a, your eyes are, your eyes are in tune with that, that animal. They're easier to see even for small animals like nudibranchs, like the one in this picture. Um, this is an orange and white striped nudibranch, which is sometimes called a candy corn nudibranch. And this one, this was a really dark tide pool, but it stood out because of its bright color. And it was upside down. So what you're seeing is the foot of this animal and they will use the um, surface tension of the water to move around. So it was just gliding right past this beautiful big green um, anemone. And it was such a, such a gorgeous scene. Um, another thing for me when I'm taking images in areas like this, where it was really dark is I like to use a higher ISO. So if you're a photographer, hopefully that makes sense, but it's something that I'm not afraid of doing in order to have a higher shutter speed that really helps to keep my images sharper. Um, rather, the lower shutter speeds tend to um, really expose any movement that you might make when you're taking an image of a smaller animal. 
This one is another tiny animal and a favorite of mine to photograph. This is a bryozoan, they're a colonial animal. And um, I mean, it's hard to believe this is even an animal, in my opinion. I mean, I, have, I get a lot of questions sent to my email at the aquarium, and people will send photos of this and say, what are these eggs? What is this thing I've seen on this plate of kelp? So this is, um, these are colonies of animals, and each one of those little compartments contains a zoid, which looks a little bit like an anemone with tentacles that come out for feeding. And um, Rachel from Harbor Wild Watch has one of my favorite descriptions of these animals. She says that they crochet themselves into existence, which I just think is a beautiful, beautiful way to describe them. Um, but they are very, very tiny. And so in this next image, you can see if you like get yourself in, I see Stina putting her face up onto the screen of the computer and you may wanna do the same, but you can see toward the center of this image, there is one little tiny zoid of this colony sticking itself out and feeding. Are you seeing that one in, in there, Stina? I can see it, it's so exciting. <laughs> It's so tiny. I was just doing a deep dive into bryozoans, and they are the weirdest animal. I like still don't quite understand how they do what they do, but I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure. wild. I exactly understand it either, but they're just, they're beautiful and so fun to, so fun to look at under a macro lens. Uh, I also, while I'm unmuted, just want to say there, the comments are going crazy with lots of like, wow, the color grading, this is amazing. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so, so. The photos are exciting. Oh, so good. Excellent. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's speaking of deeper dives, like when you're looking at these tiny animals, they're, like these whole worlds open up and on these um, kelp lace bryzoans, there are other animals that like to eat them like this cryptic nudibranch which is also super tiny and um they're a great animal to look for so uh, more it's more close and slow looking when you're out in the field i do a lot of i use a lot of um uh, clues out in the fields for finding animals so eggs are a really an important clue that i look for a lot of times especially with nudibranchs so um for this and these cryptic nudibranchs are super hard to see if you're just looking straight down onto a blade of kelp and those bryzoans. So what I will do is I will either look for their eggs or I will hold the piece of the blade of kelp and I will put it sort of perpendicular to my site so I can see if there are any bumps on the bryzoan, which then I would look at extra close to see if they were some, if there were some of these cryptic nudibranchs hanging out there. So close, close looking with a camera lens or a hand lens um, really gives me the opportunity to observe animal behaviors out in the wild. Again, without being a diver, so this is all at low tide. Um, this, these are some aggregating anemones, which are really common animal in our tide pools. And I love getting to see what's happening in this image, which are these I call them their war clubs that come out. So these aggregating anemones, they have one way that they reproduce is by, is by cloning themselves. And they really like to just be with their genetic kind. So if there is another uh, a colony of anemones near them of different genetic material, they're not gonna be too happy. And so they will put out these war clubs and zap their, and zap their neighbors with some pretty powerful stinging cells. And in situations like this, again, I do a lot of moving around. Uh, so I'm not showing any glare of the, the water. So this is looking down into a tide pool and um, I'm able to uh, move myself in such a way that you're really getting a sense that you're under the water, even though I'm not. more um, observations from up above. So these are a couple of big giant green anemones and it was a really exciting experience to see. There was a mass spawning event when I was out at the um, Olympic coast this summer. And you can see in both pictures that these are some male giant green anemones and they are releasing their sperm and they got 
stranded at low tide while they were in the process of spawning. So all of this, all of this reproductive material was sort of pooling up in these anemones and in the tide pools. And it was really, really cool to see. Another one of our really common tide pool animals, um, common, but so beautiful. This is a, um, a red sea cucumber and getting to watch these animals feed in the intertidal zone is um, one of my favorite things to do. And you can see this one is reaching its feeding arms towards its mouth. So these are suspension feeders and they feed on plankton and detritus from our waters. And watching them eat is like seeing somebody really enjoy a good meal, sticking their finger in their mouth and slowly licking it and pulling it back out. Um, so they, uh, they will do this um, more. I see this more in the spring and summer months. We have a lot of plankton in our, in our water. And this image has some glare in it, which I really liked in this instance for framing this animal in the tide pool. Um, I think photographing from the surface is a really unique perspective. This animal is one I see a lot of photographs of taken that are taken underwater, which are amazing and beautiful, but getting to see them even from above the surface is a real treat. Uh, this is a hooded nudibranch and um, they have just these beautiful textures on their body, beautiful spots and um, uh, and you can see they they have a big uh, oral veil with all of these feeding tentacles. And um, one thing that I've gotten to learn over the many years now that I've been out on the beach is that August here or in the Seattle area at Seahurst Beach, just south of us, um, that is the time that these animals are in more shallow waters. They're there mating and laying eggs and we see them in greater numbers. So it's an excellent opportunity to go and observe and photograph them during that time. Do you see these? Do you see hooded nudibranchs at this time of year down your way, Sina? I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah, we see them very occasionally. Uh, and I was going to ask if you ever smell them. Um, oh, yeah. A species that has that like Jolly Rancher watermelon flavor mm. to them. Not flavor. I haven't tasted them. <laughs> I'm sure they're salty and not delicious. But uh, yeah, they, speaking of, you know, we look, we use our eyes for a lot of observing, but it's always fun when you get a chance to engage the nose. Yes, they do. I have an incredible Jolly Rancher watermelon smell. So crazy. <laughs> And that is a defense mechanism, correct? That is something that they, yeah. My understanding, which I'm like, Jolly Ranchers are delicious. I don't know what, like, <laughs> what does the sea have against watermelon flavor? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it would not be a deterrent for me. Um, so, so I have this, um, I, I don't know, if some, some of you may be familiar with John Steinbeck's um, book, The Log of the Sea of Cortez, but there's this amazing quote, and it's, all things are one thing, and that one thing is all things. Plankton, a shimmering phosphorescence on the sea, and the spinning planets, and an expanding universe, all bound together by the elastic string of time. It is advisable to look from the tide pool to the stars, and then back to the tide pool again. And I think about that a lot. I think about that connection between all things a lot when I am out in the intertidal zone. And um, especially when coming across things like the shell that had this tiny little sea star on it. And all of those yellow spots are a, another animal, a boring sponge, and which is never boring. And then, you know, these bryzoans on here and little bits of um, bissel thread and some kelp growing on it. It was just this amazing little ecosystem. And um, I just, I don't know, it's one of my favorite things about making, about uh, making observations and seeing things through my camera in this way when I'm out um, at low tide. more connections and communities. This is a gooseneck barnacle and they have these huge clusters and they, you know, you look at these clusters and there are barnacles on them and limpets and little mussels and sometimes other animals hiding in between. So there are all of these 
tightly knit communities in the intertidal zone that I really love exploring and photographing. You know, close, close looking for me isn't only for things that are tiny. Um, I mentioned earlier that, you know, I have had the good fortune of seeing many octopuses in the wild at low tide, even though I am not a diver. And um, I just think that, you know, getting the opportunity to observe these animals for a stretch of time and not worry about running out of air is really a treat. Um, and this is another animal that makes me think of the stars and galaxies and connections. And they have all these chromatophores, which are these pack sacks of pigment underneath their skin that help them change color. And they have them on their eyes. And I just love looking at the eyes of these, these animals and thinking about, I feel like I get transported to an entirely different universe. They're just amazing. So not as not as sexy as an octopus, but the Lewis's moon snail is another favorite animal of mine to see at low tide, especially with their big foot extended. These are the largest of our marine snails in the Pacific Northwest, and they just cruise along sandy bottom beaches with this huge foot. And they can be found in the intertidal zone during the spring and summer when they are looking for mates. And they make these sandy egg collars, which I'm sure many of you have seen that um, often are mistaken for trash. They almost look like an old toilet plunger out there on the beach, but they contain half a million eggs. And they are these incredible structures um, that, that you can see at low tide. But uh, if you're walking slowly through the shallows, you can have the opportunity to see these amazing animals with their big foot out. So textures are, textures are everything. I love textures. I love tide pool textures. And I'm always tuned into textures when I'm out there doing photography. This uh, animal is a vermilion star and it was sitting on top of a blade of kelp. So it just had this amazingly dark, beautiful background, which made for a great dramatic image. I've only seen them in the wild a couple of times on the Washington coast, but I do look for them every single time I am out there hoping that I can photograph another one. Um, and kelp, speaking of kelp, I know that the folks over at Harbor Wild Watch share my passion and love for seaweeds. We have over 600 species of seaweeds in the Pacific Northwest. And they come in a variety of textures and colors and forms. And they are, I feel like they're underappreciated and they deserve the spotlight more than they, more than they get it. And, um, you know, they're a foundation of our marine ecosystem. They provide food, they provide habitat for a lot of animals, um, including salmon. And they also have uses for humans as well. Humans, we like to eat seaweeds, we like to, um, we, if you look at in your toothpaste or your ice cream or your facial cream, you're going to see seaweed in there. So it's important to a lot of different animals on the on the planet. But this is uh, photographing these iridescent seaweeds is always tricky to capture their extreme beauty. And every once in a while, I feel like I get it right. So this was one. This is one of my favorites of iridescent seaweed. They're just so beautiful. And this is another one right on the edge of downtown Seattle. Um, we have an amazing waterfront with um, excellent tide pool opportunities uh, downtown Seattle. And you can see lots of variety of seaweeds. Um, this, is a, this is a real common seaweed, a uh, rockweed or fucus. And it doesn't have to be a very low tide to find this seaweed. It lives in the upper intertidal zone. And it just has beautiful textures and um, it is always worth stopping and exploring the rockweed to see who is on it and under it. And then there we have coralline algaes, um, which have amazing textures. This branching algae gets its hard structure from calcium carbonate. And since calcification, this process that makes these plants hard, takes so much energy. These coralline algaes grow very slowly. And so an eight inch articulated coralline algae um, 
could be more than nine years old. So um, they have a very slow, slow growing period and um, they're just absolutely stunning. Uh, bull kelp is such an, is an iconic seaweed in our area. And um, I like to get myself in the picture sometimes just to, re to reflect, you know, literally and uh, metaphorically that connection between humans and our tide pool environment. Um, this is one, this is a seaweed that we do not see in Seattle, but we do see it on our outer coast of Washington. This is, has some great names, dead man's fingers, staghorn seaweed, belty fingers. I think belty fingers might be my, <laughs> maybe my most favorite common name for it. Um, but this is one of my all time favorite seaweeds. It has amazing, amazing textures. It's also kind of challenging to photograph at times. It looks really different when it is out of the water than when it is under the water. And I almost prefer seeing it out of the water actually. Um, but this is uh, sort of, they come, they will be grow in these huge clusters. And I learned that there are a couple of animals that really like to eat the seaweed and live in the seaweed. So I started trying to look for some clues that those animals might be there. And I started looking for eggs and for signs of something that didn't quite look like the seaweed. And eventually I came across some eggs and then I came across this little mysterious blob which it turns out was the animal that I was looking for. So these are the animals that I was looking for. This is a branch to sap sucker. And in this photograph, you can see there are a lot of them. This, uh, this image was taken with my Olympus TG6, so my little point and shoot camera, and it was in the water. And these animals, um, they just they they make their they make their life on that felty finger seaweed. They they like to eat it, and they they lay their eggs on it. They use it as shelter. So um, that's where they're going to spend all their time. But you can see these animals not only with a macro lens of a camera, but if I highly recommend bringing a um, a hand lens or magnifying glass with you when you go out to low tide because there's so much more you can, you can see, especially if you have an idea of what you're looking for. Um, so accessing the intertidal zone during the day is fantastic. And um, I have so much gratitude that I'm able to do that from where I live. But I have to say that my even more favorite thing to do is to explore tide pools at night. So this is some red seaweed in a tide pool at night. And this is sort of what it looks like on the beach at night. Um, Seattle Aquarium, I know Harbor Wild Watch does these too. We have nighttime um, beach walks that we uh, offer up for folks during the winter time. So in the summer, our extreme low tides happen during the day, but starting in November, we have more extreme low tides again, but they happen at night. And usually sometime between in our area from 8 p.m. to, to 1 a.m. So um, sometimes I am out there quite late at night, but it's super fun. It's a really different way of exploring and focusing. You only have your flashlight to really show you the way and illuminate small areas uh, that you're where you're looking. And um, it's a really uh, it's a really meditative way, I think, to explore the beach. And you, one of the tools that I add when I go out at low, for low tide at night is a black uh, flashlight, black light flashlight, because we have a lot of animals that biofluoresce, which is super cool. Um, it's a really fun uh, challenge to go out and try and find who is biofluorescing and then try and photograph them in that, in that state without too much um, distraction or glare. So, oh, sorry, that was a that was an aggregating anemone, the same animal that we were looking at earlier. And this is an opalescent squid with a little scooch of red seaweed behind it. And these are an animal that they're in shallower waters during, during the winter time here. So we don't really see them in our tide pools uh, during the summer, but we often see them in tide pools at night. 
and they don't need a black and white necessarily to look amazing in the tide pool. They are, um, they have lots of chromatophores like octopuses and they flash and change color and they are, um, they have some fins that look like wings and they just kind of glide through our tide pools and it's kind of magical. And this is just another, another shot of the opalescent squid at night showing off its tiny, beautiful suckers on its arms. So I, somebody was asking me about, the, about this the other day. We're talking about arms versus tentacles on cephalopods. And our squid have, uh, they have eight arms and they have two tentacles. And the tentacles are what they use for capturing prey. So generally tentacles are for prey capture only and arms are multi-use. Is that your understanding as well, Stina? I would agree with that. And then of okay. course, I have the, uh, the joke, uh, how do you make a squid laugh? Uh, I don't know. Ten tickles. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, and that our, our 25 viewers just plummeted to zero. No, just kidding. <laughs> oh, I no, have 25, I think we do like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now this is another animal that I tend to see at night in tide pools as well. And a lot of effort goes into photographing an animal like this. They are on the move. They are small. Um, it really takes uh, some more, a still area of water to be able to get, capture a good image of them when you are above the surface. Uh, this is a winged sea slug. And um, I do see them off docks on occasion, but really the, the winter, fall and winter low tides at night are when I see them most often. And um, after the first experience of seeing one that just kind of caught my eye because of the way it was moving in a tide pool, um, I began looking for them more specifically and, and um, I see them pretty regularly now. And I just learned that um, there's a reason why I see them more during the wintertime low tides. And apparently when these animals are sexually mature, it's the time that they are swimming. So they don't always swim around like this. And that um, they do this, they do not do this when they're mating. So they will only be in this sort of swimming phase in between September and February, apparently. So that makes sense that I would see them at low tide during the during the winter. And these are relatives of nudibranchs, although they are not a nudibranch. They do not have naked gills like nudibranchs do. Um, this is a, another crazy nighttime low tide find. This is a sea spider. Have you seen these, Dina? I think I've only seen one once. And yeah. it one of those like wait I thought I knew everything here what is that <laughs> <It's so laughs> yeah. wild. I find yeah. I find for myself there's a lot of what is that yeah. and get very you know get very excited so uh, this is a we have sea spiders here in the Pacific Northwest and um, kind of like seahorses the males carry the eggs so this is a male okay and they carry the eggs on their legs which you can see in this image um, this is my all-time favorite animal to photograph. Um, it's a nudibranch, the uh, frosted gerona. It's also called an alabaster gerona or a white line gerona. And um, I also see this animal a lot more uh, in, during the winter months. Um, I do see them during the summer sometimes, but it's the winter really where I see them in greater numbers. And they are a magical, magical creature and they just glow under a flashlight and they're really fun to photograph. This is uh, probably one of my favorite images of a white line Dorona. And I have this in my, I have this hanging up in my home. It's one of my favorites. So tide pools aren't the only places where I go to take photographs. I also love going to explore docks and, um, you know, engaging with community really helps to open up your eyes to new ways of seeing. And I always liked peering off docks and seeing what was there, looking by, we look for nudibranchs. But um, I have a friend, Luann Roberts, 
who um, really introduced me to a much deeper way of looking when I'm out at marinas and docks. And these man-made structures really provide a lot of surface area for dock fouling organisms. And so these are animals who like to settle on docks and an advantage of viewing marine life in this way is that it's not dependent on tides or time of day. You can really do it um, any, any time that the mood strikes you or you have time, which is really wonderful. And um, most of the photography I do on docks is with my point and shoot because I can stick it under the, the water, but I do take some images with my other um, with my other cameras too, making sure that my cameras are really secure around my neck. Uh, I have a great fear of dropping any of my cameras <laughs> off the side of the dock while I'm trying to take a photograph. Uh, this is a uh, this is a calcareous uh, tube worm taken off of the docks with the, my little point and shoot camera. Um, this is an animal you'll find a lot on docks and why you'll also find a lot of nunabranks there. These are hydroids, and this is just one species of hydroid. There are many species, um, but they are an animal that a lot of nudibranchs like to eat. So where you find the hydroids, you'll probably find some cool nudibranchs too. Um, these are very tiny and delicate and very hard to uh, to capture all their all their detail. I'm still working on perfecting, taking a picture of them. This is probably the as close as I've gotten, but they're beautiful animals. Um, this is another favorite dockside animal for me. This is a golden Dorona, and um, it's an animal that I see a lot up on the San Juan Islands when I'm poking around the docks up there. Um, uh, and the winter months also seem to be a time when this animal is a lot more abundant, although I have seen them at other times of year, but they eat a specific type of bryzoan, and so they're not a, they're not a hydroid eater as far as I know, but, um, there, we have a lot of bryzoan species here that, um, are dock fouling organisms as well, so, um, so look for them and you might find some beautiful golden deronas. Um, I'm a complete invertebrate gal. I love it's probably what I take photographs of the most that and seaweed, but I'm really fish are really working their way into my into my heart and my photography. And um, this fish is like a gateway fish for me. And one of the reasons why I love them so much um, this is the sailfin sculpin. And um, they have this beautiful dorsal fin that looks like a big looks like a big sail. And, um, and their pectoral fins are, they look like wings. They're just very graceful, graceful fish. And um, they are nocturnal, so they're not necessarily around too much during the day, but um, I've discovered that they really like to hang out on big blades of kelp in the marinas during the day. So I've had some luck seeing them when I have been out uh, taking photographs on the dock. Um, these are another type of anemone that we have here. This is a, a brooding or a proliferating anemone, and they are really weird um, animals. I found a huge uh, abundance of them up at Deception Pass when I was looking up at, uh, I think it's Coronet Bay um, Marina, and there were just so many. It was amazing. I don't think I've ever seen that many in one spot before. But in this this animal, there are no males of this species. There are only females and hermaphrodites. So they start off as females, and then they turn they turn into a hermaphrodite when they're sexually mature. And the parent anemone will brood the eggs internally until they are ready to emerge. And then they come out the mouth and slide down the column of this animal and will stay there until they're ready to go off into the world on their own. And you can see that one on the right is just covered with babies on the outside of the column. And the one on the left that has some smaller babies, but it's got that one on the edge that looks like it's just about ready. To hit the road so it's kind of a cool kind of a cool thing to see and then tunicates are a whole bizarro uh, another type of strange animal you will find a lot of um, if you're out there looking at docks and uh, this one is a colonial tunicate and it had just completely taken over 
all of the tubes of these feather duster worms. So you can see the feeding tentacles of the feather duster worms around the periphery of this, of the frame. But this animal um, was, they had just, you couldn't even see the tubes of these tube worms anymore. It was, it was crazy. And this animal is very closely related to us humans, if you can believe it or not. And they have a larval phase where they start off with a notochord, which is kind of like a, a skeletal rod almost supporting the body. And then they, as they mature, they reabsorb that notochord into their body and then they turn into these sacs, these filter feeding sacs. So they're kind of crazy animals. <laughs> And I'm gonna, this is my last photograph, but this is from my, this is from my tail. This is from my fish tail. This is the giant Pacific octopus number one that was in our tide pool. And um, you can see sometimes when I'm taking photographs, I really focused on one thing that I'm taking a picture of, but there's, if you look at this photograph, there's a gunnel in the left hand uh, corner of the photograph that I had no idea it was even there. I was so focused on that octopus and it just made, delighted me when I went back and looked at this photograph and realized that gunnel was just sitting there the whole time as the octopus was just hanging out, moving around and, and breathing. So. so just a few tips. If you like to go out and take photographs when you're out on the beach, um, just to be a considerate guest of the beach or the dock that you're visiting, and do your best to um, observe and photograph animals where they are. Um, we are visiting the home of these animals and um, trying to leave them leave them where they are is is one of the biggest tips I could give. Um, I use iNaturalist a lot as a resource for learning and for looking at what has been popping up in my area. So that helps me when I'm going out to look for things with a purpose to see what, what has been around so I know what to look for. Moving around, trying different angles, creating shadow with your body to eliminate glare from the water. Um, these are all helpful things when you're out there taking photographs. Um, polarizing lenses are something that I don't use very often, but that's another tool that you can use to really help eliminate that, that glare when you're photographing from above the water. I like to look for contrast and textures and colors, and I really like to take it very slow when I'm out there and observe as much as I can and get to know your local spots really well. You don't have to travel very far to, um, to, to find amazing things. And here's where you can find me. Um, I have a website, it's jenstronginphotography.com. And you can find me on Instagram at Jen S. Seattle. And I'm also on Facebook at J. Strong and Photography. I'm always happy to chat photography and marine life. Um, if, and if there's any questions that you have and you want to get in touch with me, you can get in touch with me at any of these places. So thank you. Amazing. And this is where the crowd goes wild. <laughs> we'll say for the last day of summer, uh, having over 27 people at one point tuning in is a pretty good showing for well, uh, good. <laughs> so, uh, the fan fandom is strong here so thank you so so much for such a fantastic presentation thank gorgeous sure. photos uh, great content um, and quite a few questions coming in so uh, we'll start yeah. with uh, one from Leslie, wondering if you edit out the detritus, knowing that the Salish Sea is full of stuff. Um, do you do any post-processing in that way? That's a really good question. Um, I do sometimes. Uh, sometimes I really like to have that in there, <laughs> quite frankly. But yes, there are times when I do edit some of that out in post. Awesome. Uh, and then just a reminder, for those of you tuning in still, We've got a whole bunch of you. Uh, now's a great time to put those questions in the comment section and I will uh, be sharing them off. So we have another question from Sarah wondering if any of the photos you shared tonight are photos from your phone. And if so, what kind of phone are you using? 
So none of the photo, none of my photos this evening were from my phone. No worries. Yeah. But I do use, I have an iPhone that I use to take some, some photographs, but yeah, but not, <laughs> not any of the photographs from the TV. There you have it, Sarah. <laughs> we're using the, the fancy phone cameras. This <laughs> Andrew, who I uh, is I know is a fellow photography nerd. He's the one chiming in about your color grading and other fantastic things. Um, he has a great question, wondering if you do group shoots or seminars. Uh, yes, I do. Um, I do from time to time. I do some. Um, I do one on offer one on one mentoring with folks, um, and I've done some. Uh, some group walks through the field trip society, but I'm hoping to do some more um, just through my own website this year. Yeah, Fantastic. especially for night, especially for night. Um, I'm tr hoping to do one for a night tide pool photography adventure this winter. Awesome. Well, uh, I think you've uh, inspired at least Andrew. I would imagine you've inspired a lot more photographers here. Uh, I will say Mary's tuning in and she's saying, I'll never see or experience a tide pool quite the same. Amazing. So <laughs> oh, that's <cool. laughs> that idea of, yeah, just sitting still and soaking it in and taking the time to notice is really just a beautiful, beautiful way to experience nature. So it is really appreciate that piece of your presentation. Uh, Margo is wondering, how do you decide to photograph in color versus black and white? Um, I'm not actually sure if you had any black and white photos, but um, maybe. I did, have a, I did have a couple and I, I shoot everything. I shoot everything in color. So anything that's in black and white is a post processing okay. decision. And sometimes, but I, sometimes I will be taking photographs of something in color with a lot of contrast and thinking that I want to convert it to a black and white image for sure. Awesome, great question, Margo. Uh, let's see, we also have Leslie tuning back in again to say, sad to have missed your last walk the other week. Um, yeah. Would love a night walk photo sesh, so. Excellent, all right. <laughs> Um, keep keep tuned to my yeah. my social and uh and and there will be more information as soon as I have it <laughs> oh, and then of course still a lot more love coming in from all sorts of folks but we'll we'll shout out Marcus and their comment amazing photos Jen <laughs> so that's fun and it looks <laughs> Leslie has a follow-up question on how do you address camera shake um I address camera shake with high shutter speed. Like that's to me that to me that's really the key for macro photography is keeping your shutter speed high enough. I feel like when it's too slow is when you really get that camera camera shake effect. Gotcha. Uh, and then we'll also chime in with Leslie's very sweet uh, gratitudes here. Thank you, Jen. Uh, for sharing your art and highlighting the cool other world out in our <laughs> water. So I definitely, I feel like the hydroid photos, like mind blowing, just like, you know, you kind of read about them, but then to actually see all those little structures is just, yeah. <laughs> they're really, they're, they're really cool animals. I want to learn more about them. There's not a lot of information about hydroids out there. Well, cheers to, uh, <laughs> This be the little hey we want to know more world yeah so whoever yeah. the hydroid expert if you're listening you know yeah you know who <laughs> to learn more we have curious people uh let's see I also just wanted to say I really uh I'm going to be using the belly jelly the hanging belly <laughs> jelly as a thing uh, as well as the healthy fingers for the codium I think You've got some good, good future names, there, Jen. <laughs> Always fun to, fun to hear that. Uh, well, it looks like I'm like, okay, folks, now is your your last shot to get some some of those questions in here before we wrap it up. But uh, uh, I guess while we while we wait for maybe a final question to to tune in, uh, I am seeing a lot more. Just the love is abundant for you, Jen. Aw, <laughs> thanks everybody. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, is there anything you'd like to leave us on before uh, I give a couple Harbor Wild Watch announcements? Uh, no, my, I guess my, my, my last thing, I just 
stay curious. That's it. <laughs> stay curious. Oh, and the Steinbeck quote was much appreciated. That was oh. beautiful. So, One of my yeah. favorites. Yeah. And then, yeah, just lots more things coming in. So uh, thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. Uh, and of course, for those of you who watch this uh, video later, uh, we're happy to, you know, if you have any questions, you have our contact information. So you can keep wondering, even though we're not live anymore. And uh, just my two Harper Wild Watch announcements are one, that we have a junior naturalist training workshop. So if you have any kiddos interested in learning more, we're doing a watershed walk at Copachuck State Park, 1030 in the morning for 25 bucks. A uh, pretty good deal for some pretty good fun. And then our peer into the night season will be kicking off. So we're so excited. And maybe, well, I think, I think we should do like a sit spot on the dock and just like, okay, everybody ready, set, belly biology and take a look into uh, the fabulous waters of the Puget Sound. Anyways, we'll, we'll, we'll muddle on that. But generally, you'll get to see what's living underneath the dock as we drive our little underwater ROV around. We'll have scuba divers pointing out cool creatures and either myself or Rachel kind of talking about all the fun stuff that we see under the dock. And <laughs> I, I can promise right off the bat that the quality of the images will not be as great as Jen's this evening. <laughs> um, so you know, you have to bear with us on our <laughs> silver screen, but uh, Peering to the Night is sure a fun, fun program that we're excited to bring back in person, maybe even with some hot cocoa. Uh, and so you get to stay, uh, I usually like to say you stay nice and dry, but sometimes it's raining. So you at least won't get salty. So <laughs> come out to the dock on the first Saturday of the month, October through March uh, to enjoy that program. Uh, and then with that, I think, again, just check in the comments, more love pouring in for this great presentation. Um, and then let's see. Uh, Okay, we do have another question from Andrew. I didn't catch your lenses, sorry, but do they have ones with optical stabilization? I love my prime, but zoom prime, but my zoom with optical stabiliz stabilization, what words are hard, makes me realize how much I shake. So is that something? <laughs> yeah, my, um, I do have one, my Sony, 90 millimeter macro lens i'm pretty sure is has that stabilization but i haven't i have a, yeah i'm pretty sure <laughs> i don't know if that really is. <laughs> but my like, camera is my camera has techniques <gasps> yeah <I know. laughs> high shutter yeah. speed that's it no. speed. Yeah. there you have it folks <laughs> And for Leslie wondering, that first peer into the night is October 1st at Jerisich Park, 7 p.m. All our, all our events will be on Facebook, and I'm sure we'll have some night beach walks coming up soon. Jen will have some night beach walks. Maybe we'll even combine our powers again, because we know that's a fun time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I would say uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in again. Uh, this video will be posted in full once we say goodbye here. So you can watch it again and catch what you missed if you're just tuning in. So uh, thank you all. And again, just great gratitude to Jen. Uh, we really appreciate you being a cocktails and fishtail speaker with us this month. So thank you again so much. And with that, I guess we'll say learn, have fun. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.